This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Multiple massive explosions in Lebanon's capital, Beirut. With an average 1,000 deaths per day, Trump still argues the U.S. has COVID-19 under control. And with the fifth highest coronavirus infections in the world, South Africa assesses the spike in cases. Hello and a warm welcome to Africa Live on CGTN. I'm Lindy Mtongana in Nairobi. And with me is Ucho Okoronkwo with a preview of your business news. Thank you, Lindy. And here's a look at what's coming up on business news. Individual consumer debt in South Africa continues rising over the lockdown restrictions. And cafes in Egypt face closure as COVID-19 restrictions threaten their business. Of course, all that and more coming up within the program for nowadays. Back to Lindy. Thanks, Uche. So we start the program with some major news coming from the international segment. A huge explosion has rocked the Lebanese capital, Beirut. A loud blast reportedly came from a fireworks storage warehouse in a port area. The explosion was felt across large parts of the city, with some districts losing electricity. The blast damaged buildings, burnt cars, and sent a mushroom cloud of smoke into the sky. Lebanese media is reporting that a large number of people have been injured and others remain trapped beneath the rubble. The blast took place ahead of a verdict for the killing of ex-PM Rafiki Hariri in 2005. A UN tribunal is due to issue its verdict. Four suspects are on trial in absentia for the murder of Hariri by a car bomb. The four are members of the Iran-backed Hezbollah group, which has consistently denied any role in the death of Hariri. Well, let's try to get you more now on this explosion in Beirut. We're joined by our correspondent, Yumna Naufai, alive in Beirut with more on this. Uh, Yumna, can you first just begin with... So far is, as you said, two seemingly large explosions rocked Beirut earlier uh, this afternoon. It was around rush hour, and it was very... It was the port, so it was very close to a highway that links the city center to many residential areas. And again, lockdown was east today, so many, many people on the streets hundreds upon hundreds of wounded. We're waiting for the casualty numbers. I'm sure they're, you know, they're gonna be high as well. Um, the cause of the explosion is not immediately clear, but uh, we could see two large clouds coming out. The health minister released a statement saying the likelihood of injuries um, and of the damage that it caused to infrastructure nearby in the city center and the whole capital area uh, is, is, is pretty bad. I, I think the likes we haven't seen since 2005 when uh, former Prime Minister Rafi Hariri was assassinated. Uh, debris and glass covered all the streets of downtown Beirut. Um, many apartments, many homes completely shattered. Now, while nothing has been confirmed, there are reports that uh, say that this incident could be related to fire uh, works. Uh, and could not be a possible attack. We're hearing different rumors. I don't want to confirm anything yet until I am sure. Yes, understandably. Uh, Yumna, turning now to, as you mentioned, the location of these blasts uh, in a residential area, we are understanding that there are a number of people trapped under the rubble after these explosions. What more can you tell us about that? Many people are trapped. Uh, I know I have family members that live in that area, and um, you know because of because of the shattered and the glass and the debris, it's very hard to move right now. Um, it, the explosion in itself, the, the explosion itself, did not happen in a residential area. We know it happened on the port, which is very close to the city center. In the city center, which is why it was able to affect all the residential areas uh, in central Beirut. Well, thank you so much for that update. Yumna Naufal joining us from Beirut. We certainly hope uh, those close to you are safe. Uh, let's turn now to some news coming out of the United States. Uh, averaging over 60,000 new cases and 1,000 deaths per day, President Donald Trump believes the U.S. has got the coronavirus pandemic under control. 
Here's an excerpt of an interview with American news website Axios, where he argued over the death toll with reporter Jonathan Swan. Well, right here, the United States is lowest in numerous categories. Uh, we're lower than the world. Lower than we're the lower world? than what is that? Europe. In Take what? Look. In what? Take a look. Right here. Here's case death. Oh, you're doing death as a proportion of cases. I'm talking about death as a proportion of population. That's where the U.S. is really bad. Well, well, Much worse than South Korea, Germany, etc. You can't. You can't do that. You have Why to go. Can't I do that? You have to go by. You have to go by where. Look, here is the United States. You have to go by the cases. The cases. Why are not there. as a proportion when of population? When we have somebody, what it says is when you have somebody that yeah. has it, where there's a case. Oh, okay. The people that live sure. from oh. those cases. It's surely a relevant statistic to say if the U.S. has X population and X percentage of death of that population. No. Well, turning to the latest on the coronavirus pandemic in Africa, authorities in South Africa say the country is moving towards the peak of its COVID-19 pandemic. Surpassing half a million infections, South Africa now has the fifth highest number of cases in the world, and it ranks in the top 20 countries in terms of deaths. Angela Coppola takes a look at reasons behind the recent surge. The virus has struck down many, and government officials haven't been spared. Three provincial premiers and four cabinet ministers have contracted the virus. But it appears from anecdotal evidence that people aren't too concerned about the virus. I don't think they take it seriously because um, they're traveling without wearing masks around and then people that don't comply about the distance that uh, has been mentioned that uh, we must give it to each other. It's been suggested that a large part of the current non-compliance has to do with fatigue. The starting point is attitudinal. Our attitude has been, this is getting in the way of our life. And, and it's the beginning with the lockdown, we're tired of the lockdown, it's getting into our nerves, uh, we want to get out there and do stuff. Um, and and, 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 and that, this is where you put off, put off, you throw care to the wind. Compliance with government regulations is patchy, with some suggesting that there are two sets of rules. Maybe in the workplace, whereby you find out that people at work, they, are, they put the mask, but the people somewhere around in the locations, they're just walking free. Even some of the bosses, you find them inside the shop, whereby the workers have got to wear masks, but the boss are not wearing masks. So they're not. They're not taking it seriously. Pandemics Data and Analytics is an organization challenging the government-backed modelers on their predictions. It says that wearing a mask won't necessarily prevent the spread of the disease. It's even hard to show an impact for medical masks worn properly by people who know how to fit them and know how to, you know, know how to use them properly. Um, so I, I would find it, uh, I wouldn't really believe somebody who said they'd done a major study and look, uh, the mask, the ordinary cloth mask wearing is effective. I think that's quite a, it's quite a speculative thing to say. With the relaxation in retail regulations, many malls are now open, but not everyone is following the rules. When I'm going through the shops, I find some people they not follow the rules about the coronavirus. Some people they washing hands in sanitizer, with sanitizer. Some people they just get in the shops without washing the hands with a sanitizer. Funerals are also a large contributor to infections. Large funeral gatherings are a fundamental part of most African societies. I come to your house when you have a bereavement because I love you. And as I do that, I'm actually endangering your life. So there was a time when we talked about the tension between lives and livelihoods. Now it is a tension between love and lives. As South Africa heads towards that peak, it's all about people's behavior and adhering to the rules and the regulations. And if they don't do that, the spike is going to continue. I'm Angelo Coppola for CG10 in Bramfontein, South Africa. Due to a lack of funds, the World Food Programme says it's only able to provide assistance to 700,000 food insecure people in Zimbabwe. That's less than half of its 1.8 million target population. The UN agency is now appealing for an additional $250 million. The funds will support up to 8.6 million people, or roughly 50% of the population, who will need assistance between now and December. Farai Mokutuya filed this report from the capital, Harare. 
Opa Kanongani is a single mother of three in Hopley, an informal settlement on Harare Southern Fringe. This porridge is the only meal she and her children will have until supper, when they will have the staple maize meal and what greens they can pick from a depleted vegetable garden. The little she is able to feed her children is courtesy of a monthly cash transfer from the World Food Programme. But the funds have been eroded by a deteriorating economy where the local currency has depreciated and inflation is soaring. I get the equivalent of $9 per child, which is $27, but all my expenses are now in dollars, including rent and some basic foodstuffs. So what I get is only enough to pay for accommodation and a bucket of maize meal. There's no cooking oil or relish or so. The struggle to make ends meet has been worsened by the COVID-19 crisis. I used to be a vendor, but since the lockdown began, we are being chased from the streets by the police. And with my children, I can't engage in those running battles. With the combined threat of the drought, the economic recession, and now the coronavirus pandemic threatening to push hard-hit communities further to the brink, donors are stepping up their efforts. In rural areas, we've shifted to in-kind assistance instead of uh, cash assistance. So that's a package of grain, usually maize or sorghum, as well as uh, um, um, oil and uh, pulses as well. Now, in urban areas, given the circumstances, we have remained with uh, cash-based assistance and cash-based assistance in the form of either USD uh, cash, cash, or through a voucher system. Either way, uh, given inflation, we have adjusted the transfer values uh, over the past couple of months from $9 to now $12 per person, uh, per household. Hopefully, that will be accompanied by an improvement in the economy so that vulnerable families like Opas can survive the impending emergency. Farai Mwakutuya, CGTN, Harare, Zimbabwe. Top Egyptologist Zai Hawass has taken to social media to respond to a tweet by Tesla chief executive Elon Musk. In his tweet, Musk states that the pyramids in Egypt were built by aliens. Hawass, though, says the inscriptions found inside the Great Pyramids tell the story of the kings they were built for, as well as those who built them. Egypt has invited Elon Musk to come and see the Great Pyramids for himself. All the tombs around the Great Pyramid mention Khufu Pyramid and the king himself. And also, inside the Great Pyramid, there is inscriptions telling us about the workmen and the gangs who built the pyramids. I found the tombs of the pyramid builders that tells everyone that the builders of the pyramid were Egyptians and they were not slaves. The pyramid was a national project of the whole nation. Ramsid II was from Sharqiyya, who was an Egyptian. All his family, all Ramasai kings, ruled Egypt from the Delta. What you said is wrong and hallucination. South Korean President Moon Jae-in is scheduled to hold an emergency meeting on Tuesday after heavy rains and floods left at least 14 people dead and another 14 missing. CGTN's Jack Barton has more from South Korea where some areas, including the holiday hotspots of Jeju Island, have already experienced their longest ever rainy season. Small streams like this one in Yongin that often flow at a trickle are now small rivers, while the capital Seoul was temporarily cut in two over the past few days as major bridges crossing the Han River, which flows through the city, were closed down due to the rapidly rising floodwaters. Most of the closed bridges and roads in the capital managed to reopen as the rain paused for a short while in Seoul on Tuesday. However, flooding and resulting landslides have led to nationwide deaths, injuries, as well as damage to almost 1,500 public facilities and an equal number of private homes, farm buildings and vehicles. More than 5,700 hectares of farmland have been submerged, with critical infrastructure damaged, including highways, some of which have been completely swept away. 
So far, more than 1,000 people have had to flee their homes. Heavy rain alerts remain in place for the greater Seoul area, which saw 300 millimetres of rain over the weekend, as well as half a dozen provinces, with heavy rainfall expected for at least another week. Some parts of the country have experienced up to 49 days of heavy rain since June 10. Experts say the weather conditions likely stem from global warming, as it's caused more ice and frost to melt, with the exposed land acting as an absorbing plate for sunlight. They say this has caused warm air to build up, pushing cold air currents towards Northeast Asia. President Moon Jae-in has called off his scheduled summer holiday to keep abreast of the crisis and is reportedly receiving daily briefings on the damage caused across the country by weeks of torrential rain. Jack Barton, CGTN, Yongin in South Korea. You're watching Africa Live, coming up after the break. We take you to Madagascar, where they make the world-famous commercial vanilla in our new special series, Made in Africa. My family has been doing this hard work for the past 600 years. dream is to be the reading player in, in, in Africa, in the spice sector. Nobody in the region consumes it. Even me cannot afford the vanilla cooking. Here is the elegance, the color, the celebration of life. Madagascar produces nearly 80% of the world's commercial vanilla. The price for first grade extraction of vanilla beans from the island hit $600 per kilogram in 2018. This increase is due to a number of factors, including van vanilla bean theft and extreme weather changes. We traveled to Madagascar's Sava region and met farmers looking at an innovative way to grow the vanilla orchid as well as improve its quality as demand for the natural flavor increases. This island nation produces nearly 80% of the world's vanilla. Regarded as the world's most popular aroma and flavor, used in foods, beverages, and cosmetics. Though, in recent years, vanilla prices have skyrocketed to more than $500 a kilogram, which makes it more valuable than silver. In short, everyone's go-to flavor for ice cream is about to get more expensive. We traveled to Madagascar's Sava region to find out how the sought-after spice is cultivated. Sadi <laughs> 
Remandrin tena nambuling atau keratia atau keratia di membul fazengja. Siapa? Nengar nazar itu, eh, feel ber primo. Eh, nazar itu dimum tiup tong. Mana nengarin kart? Nasa nazar ini pembul lepan. Amni fukun, ayo fukutan mis za. Nazar ini presiden aja pas fukun. My grand grandfather from my mother part. He, he leave China, so he get in the ship and go to Mauritius first, and then from Mauritius he get to Voemar in Sava, and he find the place very fine, and he decide to stay in Madagascar. And first he he was doing the fish business and set up in Voemar, and this is how my family start in Madagascar. <laughs> 我的名字是陈雨树我以前是个土木工程师重新搞起来想现在重新种香草<音> Isti zainya dim tong zain delinazi de refaf ke dim tong us di matzenis di sulung am zainis de refaf sulung aizi de afka tong rek izi mangan fleur ti mangan fleur senik fleur volo ni bola buton karati zainis de refaf ke ambol ngambol mayam tu mayam tu mubuk buton ti de mangu mik karati zainis de refaf mangu mangu mik karati zainis izi de mangu mik karang fleur karati zainis. Is my name Flera? Is it? The Fumba Ushvonam Zay. So, Kaf is the Mr. Ail Zang Angato, a pact among a ning, the Vimzak Tring is it? The visiting Maritani Duzer is it? Malaz is the Tsarak is from Petke for things. Is Sandam Zay is levitating them to my and to my and to my and to my and to this is what I need. For the problem, this is all. If I'm recalled, say, huh? Avi dahalu, sleep on galatra, mandrava, say. Missy, Tim, Tonda Fia, Dinga, Marius, and Karaz, Mamun, Tweet and Mamun for Levola, say, I mean, they say, Vidni, you have a Tivangendri, Amne, Lavani, Bola Tafenzeri, Kai, Nunzeri. Jadi masih bukan nol yang kerati. Ini fansa kana saja, ini nol. Namur mas. Tuwe mana nanti suap untuk fansa kana. Tuwe nanti suap saya nanti nanti fansa kau itu pulu orang atau angkat ni fokus tanah rekin. Jadi masih bukan nol. Afor yaitu na yaitu sembur na. Siapa puni? Atir na emzari. I try to modernize the plantation uh, first to control the fifth of the vanilla beans. When it is concentrated in a greenhouse, it is more easy to control the, the fifth. You can put camera, you can put dog inside. And secondly, for the profitability, usually one acre of fields in the traditional way, you can get a hundreds of kilograms of vanilla. In a greenhouse, you can get even 700 kilograms per acre. So this is very, very high profitability. And uh, secondly is you can control the climate in the greenhouse and make the flower pop up anytime you want instead of waiting for the season of flowers. 
So this is the main reason people are changing into greenhouse. And now I'm not alone. Many, many big companies now are switching for the greenhouse. Yes, the, two, the new method of planting vanilla in Sava now consists to, to concentrate all the vanilla vines in one small place. It looks like this because the vanilla vine is growing up and up. If you don't stop it somewhere, for instance, in, in the hangar there, he has to get down again and go up and get down and go up. At the end, you will have many, many vines concentrated in, in this trunk. This is one contradiction point of Sava. Nobody in the region consume it. Even myself, I just use it for doing some patisserie and seldomly I cook it, but it's very rare especially now. Even me cannot afford the vanilla cooking. Vanilla is expensive. The usual reason is only there is not enough production in the world to meet the market. And now there is a tendency of natural products. And the main, main reason is the demand cannot be stopped so it's very hard to keep the price low, actually. Zazo <laughs> L'impact ou les effets du changement climatique est visible dans tous les secteurs et dans tous les écosystèmes sur la Terre, au niveau de, du côté terrestre. On voit beaucoup de d'insuffisance de pluie et comme euh, ça a aussi entraîné des, des effets sur le, le climat en général, euh, il y a les cyclones qui deviennent de plus en plus violents qui rôde les côtes, donc les côtes deviennent de plus en plus étroites. Il y a l'augmentation de la température, il y a le décalage des saisons, la pluie n'arrive plus à, au même moment, il y a augmentation de la durée de la sécheresse. Et l'impact c'est visible au niveau de la terre donc, où il y a un changement de, de la manière de cultiver. Quand la saison est décalée, les gens, les, les producteurs ne savent plus comment faire. Donc, quand il y a une augmentation de la température, ça joue donc sur les phénomènes, sur l'activité biologique de la vanille. Et le grand, le grand défi, c'est comment impliquer donc le, le gouvernement, le ministère de l'Agriculture, dans tout ça, comment impliquer la recherche pour trouver ensemble donc des solutions pour aider la, les communautés de producteurs de, de vanille. Let's now go to Uche for your latest business news. Thanks, Lily. And here's a look at what's coming up on Africa Live Bit. Individual consumer debt in South Africa continues rising over the lockdown restrictions. 
and cafes in Egypt face closure as COVID-19 restrictions threaten their business. Africa is the nexus of enterprise and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects just in terms of revenues from taxes alone $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on global business weekdays at this time on CGTN. Well, let's start off in South Africa. The level of debt by South African consumers compared to their net income continues to rise during the lockdown, uh, of course, between April and June. Now, higher income earners were the worst affected, as Angela Coppola now explains. The problem is that incomes have been flat. So in real terms, people have less money than in 2016, as inflation over the same period has been around 20%. The real incomes have gone backwards. So there's a significant shortfall in terms of people's ability to, to, to make ends meet. And as a result, as a direct result of this, is the second trend, which is uh, essentially people are having to borrow a lot more in terms of unsecured lending, meaning credit cards and personal loans to make up for the shortfall. The central bank data confirms the increase in unsecured loans, and this has become a concern to many economists and analysts. This uh, uh, is... Uh, unequivocal evidence that not only is there a strong appetite, but it's a strong appetite for the riskiest type of lending, that if this goes wrong, there's nothing that sits behind the loan, there's nothing for the, for the lender to, to redeem. Ironically, the mid- and lower-income families are in a relatively better position. Debt levels haven't escalated to the same levels as the high net worth families. Their ability to borrow has been significantly curtailed over the last couple of years as a direct result of um, the debt relief bill that was talked about. Uh, essentially, there was a conversation about writing off some of this debt. And I think what happened is that many of these consumers haven't been able to borrow at the levels that they used to borrow. And as a result, uh, their debt levels have been more or less the same. There's other data released recently that points to another potential catastrophe, unemployment. If you look at the bank serve data that came out last week, for instance, pointing to uh, uh, the payroll data, it shows one in five disappeared from the payroll uh, through the course of June. And then alongside that, those that stayed on the payroll, uh, substantial evidence of downward wage or income pressure. So there's, uh, there's no way of dressing this up. You know, the evidence is unmistakable that the income side of the economy, the household income side of the economy is under material pressure. The data really is around that first part of the national lockdown and we're going to see more pain as more information gets released about the following months. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. And still in the country, South African Breweries is expected to cancel all its planned investments, estimated at $290 million. Now, this is due to revenue losses sustained during a near three-month ban on alcohol sales over the coronavirus crisis. The ban to the end of May was reinstated in July in a bid to free up space in hospitals which were burdened by what officials say were avoidable alcohol-related injuries. Now, the country's industry has been amongst the hardest hit by restrictions as job losses rise to 118,000. Experts are saying that a nine-week ban on alcohol sales will cost another 84,000 jobs and $886 million in GDP. Industry associations are calling on the government to drop the alcohol ban with some restaurants, bars and even tavern owners considering closing for good. Meanwhile, Egypt's cafe owners also risk a closure due to financial hardship following government-imposed restrictions on their working hours. Now, the businesses have long depended on evening opening hours, but measures which are aimed at curbing the spread of the coronavirus mean that they now can't operate at peak times. CGTN's Daniela Pearson reports. Cafes all around the world are facing huge losses due to coronavirus restrictions. In Egypt, owners are considering closing their businesses to end their losses. Despite the government allowing cafes to return to work after easing measures, 
Limited opening hours, half capacity and a ban on water pipes are hitting the businesses hard. When the Prime Minister said that cafes can open, but without shisha, we opened. However, it is not working for us profit-wise, and we are losing. After the onset of the coronavirus, things have really been affected, such as opening times and the closure during the first three months. It has affected the cafe and their allowed capacity. Because it's too small, we can't sit outside anymore, as there are laws that we need to abide by. Facing huge losses, Ali has been forced to lay off 14 workers as the number of customers continues to shrink. Before the pandemic, Ali would count an estimated 300 customers. But now, having just 50 customers visit his establishment has become a Herculean task. When I have $19 at the end of the day, where can I get the cost of my products? How can I pay for my electricity? How can I pay for my taxes? How can I profit from a private business with which I have to feed my children? It is not worth it at all. I am honestly thinking of closing because we're not getting anything out of it. It doesn't cover the effort, the costs, the products, the salary of the workers, and not even the monthly income. There's also gas and electricity and water bills that need to be paid. The biggest business used to be the water pipes, or as they're popularly known, shisha. But some customers also struggle to adjust to the new opening hours. We are a people that naturally like to stay up at night, especially during summer. We like to stay up late. So the fact that coffee shops now close at midnight is for us culturally difficult. This is different from people in other countries. They all live at midnight, but here people stay up until dawn. Last week, authorities reduced curfew by two more hours, allowing cafes to work until midnight. But with revenues in the sector dropping, most business owners are still searching for ways to stay afloat. Daniela Pearson, CGTN. Well, let's turn our attention now to commodities. Crude oil producers across the world are hoping prices rebound, and that's after being hit by a double whammy. That's the price war followed by COVID-19. Well, Owen Fairclough has the details for us. Venezuela has one of the most broken economies in the world, but a lot of crude oil, and it desperately needs to sell some. At this moment, there are no ships that want to come to extract the crude, and that means that the inventories are at their maximum, and that maximum of inventory causes production to close. Like other sectors, crude has suffered from COVID-19, but the pandemic merely compounded a battle for market share between the OPEC cartel's leading member, Saudi Arabia, and non-member Russia. They sent prices through the floor by flooding the market with a glut of crude, just as the pandemic brought the world and demand for oil to a standstill. The losses have been enormous, nowhere less so than in Middle Eastern states in the Gulf Cooperation Council, or GCC. For this year, we project that they will lose in terms of oil revenues around $270 billion. OPEC and Russia agreed to cut production and global prices have picked up enough from 30-year lows for producers to open the pumps a little more. Economists forecast crude oil prices rising to around $50 a barrel next year. That's more than double the lows they hit in the spring. But that forecast is contingent on a strong economic recovery. And there are doubts about that recovery now that coronavirus is surging in parts of the world that thought they were on top of it. Owen Fairclough, CGTN, Washington. And now some international news. TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, says that the United States state's goal is to ban the app rather than force its sale. Now, the statement comes after U.S. President Donald Trump said he wanted a big percentage of the proceeds of a sale to go to the U.S. Treasury. Well, CGTN's Lara Parpan has more. Sell or shut down. The pressure to divest TikTok's American and international businesses has left its Chinese parent company, ByteDance, facing tough decisions. It's got to be an American company, it's got to be American security, it's got to be owned here. The U.S. president added that the U.S. government should get a slice of the pie if a sale goes through. I said a very substantial portion of that price is going to have to come into the Treasury of the United States. 
Beijing has called the move outright bullying. This goes against the principles of the market economy and the WTO's principles of openness, transparency and non-discrimination. However, on Capitol Hill, there seems to be bipartisan support for the ban. But this color is called dangerous pink. In a letter to employees, the CEO of Beijing-based ByteDance played down the threat. Zhang Yiming said he was exploring all possibilities to resolve the confrontation. He stressed that the company was privately held and willing to adopt more technical solutions to allay the Americans' concerns. Experts feel TikTok's rise has come at an unfortunate time in China-U.S. relations. The U.S.-China relations are already strained, so this creates yet another point of contention between uh, what are the two largest global economies. Microsoft has confirmed it's in talks to buy out TikTok's American operations, saying it would make sure all data remains in the U.S. Millions of users are hoping this will be enough. TikTok's never coming back. I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss you guys. Lara Parpan, CGTN. Now, across Europe, TikTok is gaining popularity with record numbers of downloads of the video sharing app. Whilst questions remain about privacy, celebrities are realizing the potential audience they can reach on the platform. Well, John Beaver reports now from Frankfurt. It's the social media app that's taking over the world. Millions of downloads and only getting more popular here in Europe. Turkey leads the way, something in the region of 30 million users, according to figures published last year. Almost 24 million people follow chef Burak Özdemir for his impressive knife skills while smiling at the camera constantly. In Germany, it's camera tricks and clever editing, which has helped user Falco Punch become the most followed account. Figures from last year claimed there were 5.5 million active daily users in Germany who spend about 50 minutes a day on the app. On average, each user opens it 10 times a day, which means a staggering 13.5 billion videos are viewed each month in Germany alone. Celebrities here have started to realise the potential audience that TikTok gives them. Bayern Munich striker Robert Lewandowski can often be seen dancing with his wife. And during the coronavirus lockdown, millions watched and copied his footballing challenges. This nondescript London building is TikTok's current European base, and the city could be the home of a new headquarters. President Trump claims TikTok puts US user data at risk and is threatening a ban. There are similar concerns amongst some here in Germany for Facebook, Instagram and other social media apps about how they handle user data. Given the age or the general tendency to, to deal with data privacy and uh, a lack of awareness in general, because there's not a lot of education about it. Right? In the end, it comes down to having a, a user being aware of what uh, he or she is doing. And there's only a limited amount of what you can do to legally control it, because enforcing this is rather difficult. There are many unanswered questions about the ownership, direction and future of TikTok. But in the short term, an increasing number of downloads is one certainty. John Beaver, CGTN, Frankfurt. Well, that's all for now on Africa Live Biz. But coming up later on Global Business Africa, ShopRite Holdings plans to sell its stake in its Nigerian subsidiary. And that's yet another South African retailer retreating from other markets on the continent. Of course, all that coming up top of the hour. For now, it is back to you, Lindy. Thanks, Uche. Well, let's take a short break. Your sports news coming up next. Up ahead, a special series on the effect the postponement of the Olympic Games has had on athletes. How would you create your legend?